Welcome back. We're here for another episode, uh, episode number 24. Uh, we're now about to enter into August, the dog days of summer, but that means Sooners football is uh, is right there. It's, we can almost taste it at this point. It's been, it felt like a very long time, I think, with beating Florida the way that the Sooners did and all the hype going in this season, it's made the offseason feel that much longer. But uh, before we get into it, we just want to say we really appreciate all the support, the subscribers that we've been gaining, the views, the comments, the input that you guys have been giving to us. It gives us a lot of motivation and it really, really um, makes us want to keep growing and keep putting out more content. So if you hadn't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button, notifications, and like this video and uh, comment and let us know what you think about this. So on this episode, we've got some recruiting news uh, with Cedric Roberts now committing to the Sooners kind of out of the blue, honestly. And then there's a rumor at the running back spot with Marcus Major. And then obviously the hot, top, top, hot topic um, is OU and Texas and the SEC, which hard to believe it's been about a week. We've gone from happy in the big 12 to there's a vote on the way of joining the SEC potentially. So uh, a lot has happened in the last week. Uh, we'll get right into it. So we'll start with the um, some of the most recent news with Cedric Roberts coming in the Sooners. Uh, 2022 three-star defensive tackle uh, from Pflugerville, Texas, which uh, if you know, some people are some diehard Sooner fans. They might recognize that city. Uh, a great Sooner alum has came from there in Samaj P. Ryan. Um, so, you know, great memories. Hopefully we get another quality athlete like P. Ryan and, and Cedric Roberts. Uh, he's, he's a little underrated, I think, in my opinion. Uh, according to 247, he's number 663 overall and 97, number 97 defensive lineman. Um, you know, he kind of came out of the blue. And uh, but a guy that we've watched some his highlight tapes on it, he seems pretty underrated, high motor and, and very athletic. It just seems like that he he has it. He has all the physical abilities. It's just more honing in his skill and getting some more tape. And he might rank up or he might go up in rankings this fall. Uh, Jose, do you want to add anything on him? What's your takeaway with him or anything like that? Uh, you kind of said it in regards to what his tape showed. I think the biggest takeaway that I really had was, I mean, you know, if we think back even four years ago, getting a three-star defensive tackle or really getting any, you know, touted defensive talent was a big deal for Oklahoma. But now he kind of came out of the blue and people were like, oh, that's cool. You know, good for him. Glad we added more depth to the line. But like now we're only looking for five and four stars that are, you know, top 100 players on, every, on everyone's list. I mean, this guy is going to definitely be a player to look out for, and I think he will make an impact at some point for the Sooners. I just don't – I wouldn't expect him to be like a, you know, true freshman guy, maybe not even a, a redshirt freshman guy, but he'll definitely be on the field at some point during his career as a Sooner. Yeah. Brandon, what do you have to say? What do you have no, to say I, about I, I, uh, I definitely agree a little bit with what with, with Jose is saying. Um, definitely not a freshman player. Um, but you and I mentioned it during Isaiah Coe's who that, um, kind of like a host is going off of like three stars four years ago was, man, we, he believed we got this kid to now we're going for top hundred players only. Um, I love the commitment. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise for the day. I didn't see it coming. Um, but it, it adds more depth to the deepest spot on the team. And that's something we talked about before too. Um, I, I love it. Yeah. And there was a question about him as far as, is, is he a take? For the Sooners because of that quality of talent and the recruits that are still out there and what I've seen is that Marcus Hicks which I know we figured that out during um, the Big 12 media days he made the switch from defensive line to the offensive line uh, with his recent injury and I think you know he played some offensive line in high school and there's some depth that needed to be filled in after Stacy Wilkins in entered into the transfer portal so that scholarship you know has been given to him or that place anyway was given to him as a true defensive tackle because he's not a guy Roberts is not a guy that will play inside and out. Um, he's just going to be playing inside and plugging up the, the interior line. And then the question is, is are a few other uh, defensive linemen that the Sooners are in on, is there going to be enough room for him? And I would say, yes. Yeah. So, you know, the couple guys that the Sooners are really hard, you know, hard recruiting or recruiting hard is um, Omari Abor which I think Abor, you know, he's seemed to kind of slip a little bit 
as far as the interest in the Sooners. I know he grew up a Sooners fan, but I think they are going to get him back on campus this fall. The move to the SEC has piqued his interest because he likes LSU. I think he likes Alabama. I don't think he's big on Ohio State. I think he wants to play in the SEC. Well, we can provide that for him. And he grew up a Sooners fan. Then you have Kenyatta Jackson, which Kenyatta Jackson is going to visit Ohio State here pretty soon. But he's going to be on campus this fall uh, for a game, I believe. And he's someone that seems to be 50-50 on Ohio State and uh, Oklahoma. But with this recent announcement going to the SEC, assuming it all goes through, his family's really excited since he's from Florida. And, they're, he, you know, the Sooners will be playing Georgia, Alabama, and the Gators down in there. So they're going to be able to see their, their son. And so you've got that. And then you've got Gabriel Brownwell Dindy. Obviously, he lives in College Station now. But he he's not going to be a straight defensive tackle. He's going to be Isaiah Thomas play in and out, you know, some on the edge, some on the inside. All three of those guys, if they want to be Sooners, they will be Sooners. There's no worry about him, Cedric Roberts, taking their scholarship spot. If the Sooners somehow swing all three of those guys, um, they're going – that's going to be fantastic. But I think the most likely is Kenyatta Jackson and Gabriel Brownwell. Did. What about Chris think, McClellan? Did you mention him yeah, when you were going? Oh, no, and – I, I didn't mention Chris McClellan and he's also there too. And he's also a take, I actually totally forgot and yeah. uh, about him and, and the Sooners have been kind of, you know, working on him and, you know, he's been an Ohio state lean and it'd be something to keep he's your an, eyes on. He's an in-state kid. One that you really don't want to lose out of all, no. out of all the guys you mentioned, you really like to keep the in-state you, you yeah. recruit your own state first. Yeah. And I, I honestly think all four of those guys are good enough. Now you brought up McClellan they're all going to be takes that they want to be Sooners. Um, it's just, is what it is. I just think Roberts, he was a take because Hicks uh, switched. Another thing about Roberts, he's, he's athletic, obviously. I mean, he's got that huge frame and he's, he's a, he's a two sports star in high school too. So he's, I mean, he, he's, he's a DT that can move around, chase running backs down mm -hmm. make plays in the backfield. I mean, if, if nothing yeah. else, an, uh, an excellent depth piece for a very yeah. deep position on the team. Yeah. And, and he's playing in Hendrickson High School, which I'm not overly familiar. I mean, I know some of the big schools in Texas, but that's 6A Division One football down in Texas. So he's not playing at some podunk high school. He, you know, he's playing big time college or not college, high school football. So he's not, I mean, he's got some talent. I think he's someone that over the next, you know, six months over the course of this next season, he could see the fourth, you know, a fourth star or at least go up and that number six, 663 overall player could be two, 300, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he could, if he has a good season. So kinda I don't got think the, there's, uh, sorry, oh, go ahead. sorry to interrupt. He's kind of got the, uh, the kind of prototypical build that we're looking for on the defensive side. You know, we have the prototype DB and he's kind of fitting the mold for the prototype defensive lineman at this point, just big and strong. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we talked about athletic, like Brandon brought up, he plays basketball. So, I mean, a D lineman playing basketball, that. It's that what it takes. Because, uh, uh, I mean, you know, with this SEC move at this point, all it, it's inevitable. It's just a matter of time. You look at the, you know, the top dogs in the SEC, Alabama, LSU, consistently their defensive line is not your 6'2", 240 pound, you know, God, they're huge. Look like at Raekwon mm -hmm. Davis from Alabama, who uh, I think he, he was a D tackle there. Now he's a Miami Dolphin. The guy's like 6'5", 6'6", 280. Like, he's huge. These are the guy, kind of guys, you know, looking, I think, looking ahead. That, like, this, this, this whole SEC talk, it was six months in the making. Like, they were doing it behind closed doors quietly, not disclosing it. When you're talking about the mold, this is probably something that, you know, Grinch and Lincoln Riley were like, hey, so this SEC thing, we're going to make it happen eventually. Let's, in order to compete here, we need to have these huge D line to go up against these huge O line type. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And there might be, yeah. And that's someone they keep developing and they, he might grow a little bit. I mean, the kid's 16, 17 years old. He might be six, four, six, five before he gets on campus. So, you know, it's always nice to pick up another defensive lineman. That's the second commit that the Sooners have gotten on the D line for the 2022 class joining uh, Derek Moore. So, you know, bringing in some depth and there's four targets still out there that the Sooners might land two or three, or they could clean house in theory at four with all four, but I would think two or three is pretty safe to assume they're going to be able to land, which is, that's a win to me. Definitely. So um, if you guys don't have anything else to add, we'll move on um, to the, to a rumor. 
and it might be true is Marcus Major. I don't really know what it is. It's there's a rumor floating around that he got injured, whether it's a knee or something, and he's going to be out for the year. So if I were to guess, it's either probably an ACL, Achilles, something like that, you know, a year long recovery road. And so there goes, you know, there, that hits the, the depth a little bit at the running back position. Obviously, this is um, a lot of running backs have been kind of going down over the last uh, the last or this off season. And um, someone that could and it's been a rumor too that could fill in in the running back room is Brian Darby. Um, you know, this is someone that you probably haven't heard of unless you really follow recruiting closely. He was in the 2019 class. Uh, he's from somewhere out of Texas. I can't remember what high school, but he was a, recruited as a wide receiver, but he played wide receiver and running back uh, for his high school. And he, you know, he caught for 1300 yards and 11 touchdowns and rushed for 400 yards and 13 touchdowns in a couple years in high school. So he's versatile. He, I think he's, well, let me see. He's, um, he's about six foot tall, at least coming out of high school. He's about six foot tall, just under 200 pounds. So he's, he might be bulking up. He's probably bulked up a little bit since he's gotten to school. He might be 205 or something. That might be someone that they have, well, we need to watch that could be joining the running back room. Uh, Brandon, do you have anything to say about the running back depth or, you know, Brian Darby maybe going to play the yeah, position? Well, you know, so at the moment we saw it on the 24 seven message board, right? That like that's, hmm. which is, I mean, it's, it's a good source. And, 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 and Brandon Drum, you mentioned, um, uh, I think I'll, before we started the show, you mentioned how Brandon Drum kind of commented on it and kind of, you know, making it seem like it's pretty for real. Uh, first of all, but at this point it is a rumor. So, but if, if it is true, the first thing that comes to my mind is how huge is these transfer running backs that we got this year with Eric Gray and um, Trey Bradford. If they don't transfer, the, that running back room is, is Kennedy Brooks. And who else? Jaden yeah. Knowles. No, yeah, now Knowles, and then it would have been uh, yeah, Pledger. Yeah, well, Pledger probably wouldn't have transferred then either. Oh yeah, or yeah, I mean that's true. But uh, these transfers, I mean, it's huge that they decided to come to Oklahoma because that room is thin now with Seth McGowan doing illegal stuff and Marcus Major potentially being out for the year. Um, and, don't don't know a whole lot about this Darby. Um, just other than the stats you meant that that you read. Um, it's a good thing he's versatile. Uh, it, yeah. if it, it helps. It helps him potentially crack the field because as a receiver, I, I don't think there's a shot he sees the field. Oh, yeah. I think you you kind of hit it spot on. It's going to be tough if we keep if there's any injuries during the season. We're going to have a tough time running the ball. We got to make sure that either one of the Kennedy or Eric Gray, or if there is an injury, there those guys are going to become bell cow backs and be ready to put a lot of miles on your body. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I think when I was doing some research to see like the legitimacy, if there was a reported on it anywhere else other than on message boards, see if someone else had put it, something out there other than Brandon Drum, the things that kept coming up was how high Lincoln was on Marcus. He really saw him as a contributor this season. He thought he was really going to, you know, bring something to the offense. You know, obviously he wasn't going to say what it is, but it's, I think it's safe to assume he was probably going to be a guy that, we were going to see a lot on you know, pass plays, some sort of trick plays, and maybe take some snaps away from Eric and Kennedy. But now if this rumor is true, then this he's, guy's not going to get to play until next year. He showed up big in his limited role last year. I mean, I think against Florida, he had, he had like a 48 yard touchdown run. I mean, he's, he's, he's very he's good. good. It's a, it's a tough loss. There's no doubt about it. If it's true. I mean, like I said, like we've all talked, Fingers crossed that, you know, it's just a message board rumor thing that doesn't come to fruition, but. Yeah. We'll see. And you were, and you were talking about who would be, you know, there. TJ Pledger probably wouldn't have transferred. So it would have been Brooks and Pledger and then Jaden Knowles. And then um, there's a guy on the roster named Todd Hudson. I've, I've never heard of him before, but that would have been about it. So, yeah, these couple, couple transfers in and just in time for the transfer portal, it played out in, in the Sooners favor for sure um, but hopefully it's all fake news and not real but there is a rumor floating around and uh, just you know 
just not saying it's true, but it might be. It might be something we have to watch over the next few weeks and that they're managing. So if it is true, they can't disclose it much longer. No, no, we're you know, gonna we're, know because we're, we're coming up can. on that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll know. So uh, we'll keep you guys updated on that. Um, and now we'll move on to the hot button over the last week plus now, um, OU, Texas, into the SEC. At this point, you know, since our last video of talking, just updating, you know, we we were, it was all a rumor. Well, since then, the Sooners and, and the Longhorns have put in their, um, you know, intentions of not renewing the contract or the grant rights, and then they have officially applied or, you know, asked for acceptance in the SEC. And now that there is a set meeting, I believe on Thursday, the, uh, the 29th, uh, that the SEC board members and or presidents and stuff are going to meet and discuss. I don't know if there's technically going to be a vote. There's been rumors about a vote happening um, to allow OU and Texas into the SEC, which if it doesn't happen, on Thursday, I would think it's going to happen in the next week. Honestly, I really do think the vote's happening tomorrow. I think, like we talked about earlier, this has been something that they've been scheming for the past six months, OU Texas and the SEC. Well, OU Texas and some back channels, whatever they're calling, I don't know, ESPN, whatever. Some people have been involved that weren't involved, but they really are. And um, so it it's going to happen. They're going to, and I really think it's happening in the 2022 season. I think we're getting in, in the next six, seven months, eight months. I think we're going to be there really fast. What do you guys think? I think that first. this is just the beginning. I don't see it happening in 2022, just because from what came out today with the big 12 commissioner saying that, you know, or sending out the cease and desist letter to ESPN. And right before we got on, I saw tweets from multiple um, you know, journalists that are really following this closely saying that Boldly would not have put out that statement if it wasn't true, that he has hard evidence. I think at this point, if ESP, if OU in Texas would have just left and there was nothing more that was reported or nothing more happened or was found, then yeah, we put what would have made a quick move because it sounds like ESPN is trying to get rid of the Longhorn Network, which would have pretty much paid for OU's and UT's exit from the Big 12 um, and gotten us there faster. But I think now it's going to be the Big 12 is going to be really angry about what's happening with ESPN potentially being involved in and the exit of a lot of big 12 schools and might just extend it to 2023, but I definitely don't see it waiting until 2025 anymore, just because there's way too much money in, in play for ESPN and the big 12, I don't think will benefit from forcing assist tape for the next four years, but it could work out, you know, making us play for two more seasons in the big 12 wouldn't be the worst thing for, for us or for them, because we'll just keep adding more rings to the players hands and Lincoln will have, two handfuls of rings and hopefully an addy by the time we get to the sec yeah i i agree with everything you said hose you kind of hit everything all the points i was going to make um but see i kind of agree with brum i think oklahoma and texas both are going to do everything in their power to force it to 2022 um as we've mentioned earlier it's helping in recruiting i think if you look at oklahoma specifically um chris mcclellan is starting to trend a little bit our way and so it's um his name just Gentry escaped. Williams. Gentry. Gentry Williams, yes. Just so in that, you know, I think the SEC thing plays plays a huge role in that. There's no way we go to 2025 because these kids that we want who want to play in the SEC, they wouldn't even have a chance to play in the SEC wow. if we waited that long. Um, what about like the SEC network? Can the SEC network buy out the Longhorn network? And that See, would give the funds for us to yeah. move sooner. And How does that work? And I think, like Jose said, there I saw a report that I think there's 10 years left on the Longhorn Network, approximately 160 million, which is yeah, it would which pay is the 80 million oddly, dollar buyout for OU and Texas, yeah, it'd be perfect. which is very odd. You know, it just it's just weird how that number works out. And I almost think ESPN would would be like, okay, we'll just write you that check, or we'll pay you up front. You just get out. You join the SEC the money that we're going to pay you out early for 
is going to not, it's going to be peanuts compared to what we're going to generate in the, on the SEC network. And don't forget, they are taking over the SEC call from CBS in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, it's, it, and they're going to be dominating huge, to happen as soon as possible. They're going to be dominating huge markets football wise. Now they're going to have most of this. I mean, the two relevant schools in Texas, I mean, Texas tech, you know, had their little run for a couple of years when cook was there, but now they're not really relevant anymore when it comes to football. Really. I think the biggest concern here is all that the, is also going to hold the big 12 to try to force us to stay to for the 2022, 2023 season is they have nothing to replace Oklahoma and Texas right now. I mean, they're not going to yeah. get that same level to replace those two schools, but they have just no one and you know lined up. I saw rumors about them discussing adding BYU and a couple other schools, and I think you know Brandon's probably going to mention it, but you know schools from the um, AAC like they they need to add schools because I don't think that they have much going for them if Oklahoma and Texas leave. I mean, their yeah. the basketball will still be pretty good, but. Texas is going to be a big, big draw for basketball to the SEC. And it's, it definitely seems like the big 12 is just going to hold us hostage just because they're angry at what, what is happening rather than just cooperating with the schools and ESPN to get us out. Well, and the thing is, but you know, they can try to, one thing is they could try to hold you hostage, but the, the layout is if you pay your money, they they have to accept it you buy yourself out so if espn writes a check and gives it to texas and oklahoma and they're out because once once ou gets accepted in the sec at that point espn is just going to go right to texas and do their contract negotiations write the check and be done with it and buy them out and be done i i think there's just so much money involved and you know at the end of the day this is what it's all about. And I mean, there is also some competition, but what's funny is I just got an ESPN notification saying that the big 12 alleges ESPN trying to destabilize the league and ESPN claims that there's no merit to that, that uh, accusation. But the thing is, I think this has been long. This has been in the works for a very long time, even before OU reached out. I, I, just think that they're tired and we're all tired of the 11 a.m kickoffs i understand fox is fox can't compete with espn and cbs and for the primetime games i get that and i just think the money that you can make in the sec upgrading facilities paying coaches more keeping the best of the best why wouldn't and i don't know i just feel like i feel like ou and texas started this on their own and maybe got some assistance from ESPN. And I don't think now ESPN is really meddling with the league. I think it's uh, schools yeah. realize that they need to go somewhere else if they want to get, you know, good revenue payouts and, and uh, revenue shares and stuff. I just, I kind of think at this point, West Virginia wants to be a part of the ACC, you know, Kansas, Kansas and Iowa state want to be a part of the big 10 and, Maybe another school goes to the ACC and a couple go to the Pac-12 and be done with it. See, that's what I was, I was going to say. The Big 12, instead of doing all this stuff, trying to keep Oklahoma and Texas till 2025 or playing these games that they're doing, you know, saying ESPN is trying to kill the league and all that, they should be turning all of their focus to trying to salvage some of these the, the teams that are currently there. You know, they should be talking to West Virginia, Kansas, Iowa State. If, if they could keep these – the little eight intact that are still there and add like host uh, uh, some of those, those smaller conference schools, like a, like a Tulsa, a Houston, a BYU, a Cincinnati. Then at least you keep your league alive. And it's obviously not going to be half the same, but your league is still alive then instead of it completely dissolving the big 12 at this point, it's inevitable. Oh, Texas and Oklahoma are not, they're not sticking around for the long haul. It's like a divorced couple that are living together right now. It's never going to work out. So they should be focusing on rebuilding what they have and keep, keeping what they have intact and then adding some of these other schools that, you know, play in these little, little conferences and try to keep their league somewhat relevant. Yeah. And yeah. It, now, one of the things we so. haven't mentioned yet is um, 
you know, the, the Bedlam game sticking around or not once the move to the SEC does happen. Because I think, you know, we're, we're talking about it as if it is just rumored it, it's going to happen. There's there's way too much money on the line for everyone. And it's and we're not going back to the Big 12. There's nothing, there's nothing holding us there. No reason to stay. I personally am not opposed to it being gone forever because then Oklahoma State can just completely lose all the money that's keeping them alive and maybe they just go away <laughs> as a university. But you know, if they want to continue to play us after their president keeps talking all that trash about the leadership at the University of Oklahoma and how we're completely not taking the state into account and you know whatever dumb reasons she has, in my opinion. We, we like, followed the University of Texas in a move that is detrimental to the state of Oklahoma. It doesn't make sense. Like there, there's, I'm trying to understand where she's coming from, but the state of Oklahoma is just going to gain so much revenue from a move to the SEC because their fan bases are much more loyal. They have a little, they're more widespread across the country. So they're going to be traveling to Oklahoma. There's businesses are going to be doing very well and probably recovering from this last year. The only part of Oklahoma that hurts from this move is Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yep. And Payne no County means less funding. Payne County. Payne County. No, I, yeah, it's just, I think it's going to keep happening. I, I think you look at, there are multiple schools or multiple state schools that play every year, even if they're in different conferences. You know, you got the Cyhawk, Iowa, Iowa State, uh, Florida, Florida State, Clemson, South Carolina. And I'm sure there are more, oh, I'm sure there are more, I can't think of them off the top of my head. And I think this is more of like, we're going to play you every year, which is one of our outer conference games. And even though we don't, we're not big fans of Oklahoma State, they're not, they're not horrible. And they're, they will be a good resume builder. I mean, a nice little addition to our SEC schedule to play them every year in one of our three outer conference games, which I certainly hope we're going to a nine game schedule. They have to put us at a nine game conference schedule. There's no eight and you get a cupcake in November anymore. And I know Alabama's probably pretty upset about that, not playing the Citadel week nine they or week 10 or whatever it is. They love the Citadel week nine. Yeah, and there's nothing better than watching 77 nothing. So, but I think that's going to be good because o- OSU will, you know, those will be pricey tickets too. They'll get the revenue and it keeps them relevant in the TV, you know, national spotlight. They get their one chance at Oklahoma and, you know the very rare chance that they win it'll be big time for them how, and how long does oklahoma state because you know, like you mentioned they're they're not horrible and you know yeah they're not they're they're, they're always ranked you know a eight or nine win team usually um how long do they sustain that if they if the big 12 dissolves and say they join a i don't know let's go worst case and say they join like a the american conference or something they're they're not <laughs> gonna be in the american conference i mean they're gonna be in the pac 12 but if I, they stay in the big so if the big 12 saves itself and they add let's say they actually add four teams and make it 12 and this is assuming that they keep the the eight teams that are intact that that conference you have nothing that is like that's who's your your revenue like wh- why are recruits going there to play 11 o'clock kickoffs against schools that are all going to be bad in a matter of years because no one wants to go there anymore. I think that their best shot is adding SMU for some reason that their recruiting is doing better this year. So maybe getting funding from a big 12 power five conference will help them out, bring SMU back to some sort of relevancy in the football world. And I mean, they still have basketball in the big 12, so maybe that'll keep them around a little bit, but you're right. Like if they don't keep the eight schools they have now, then Oklahoma state is just going to become an irrelevant big Pac-12 school when it's Pac-12 at night playing at midnight on the East Coast where no one's watching and it's the, the recruiting is going to go to shit. Can you imagine watching Oklahoma State USC at 9 o'clock in Stillwater? Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I really want them to go to the Pac-12. Like, I would think it would be really cool to see USC come to town. It really kind of would be in Oregon. Um, but, but I will say that recruiting-wise, though, even in the Big 12, they pull in mostly three stars and a couple four stars. They're not pulling in like crazy, you know, bunch of five stars. I mean, they, they got Shetron, but I don't think the recruiting is going to change at all. Even if it, they stay in the Pac or the Big 12 or go to the Pac 12 or go to the Big 10, I don't think that changes at all. I think the best case scenario, they do go to the Big 10 because basketball, wrestling, and then football 
you know, the wrestling program that was, would, would do well. That was what I was going to So the Pac-12 thing, because wrestling program at Oklahoma State is huge. Pac-12 doesn't have any wrestling at all. So how would they do that? Because Oklahoma State's not just going to dissolve that program. No, I think I think what they might end up doing, it could be something like oh, what if they go to the Pac-12 for every other thing, they would probably either be independent or they would would join the Big Ten for just wrestling. But I I kind of think that they have a chance of going to the Big Ten. And I did see some crazy report that the Pac or the Big Ten is thinking about trying to go get USC and like go all the way from east coast to west coast and i think rumors are floating around but it's just like i don't know that would make no sense no people are kind of just getting a little out of hand with the rumors and i don't think there's much relevancy to or legitimacy to many of them but i think that what we've seen about the big 12 so far there is some merit to it just because they are in shambles right now with what is happening with oklahoma and texas leaving and Mm -hmm. they're they're really just kind of trying to salvage their they should be trying to salvage what they had like have like brandon said but they're doing so much fighting and bitching about oklahoma leaving and not doing the good thing for the state and texas a&m and texas you know going back and forth it's just the drama has just started that's that's pretty much the reason i don't think that we're moving in 2022 but if it if it comes to an end in the next two months, then yeah, I could definitely see us yeah. moving quicker than well, 2023. If, if one school, one more school bows out of the Big 12 and is going to another conference, it's gonna be it's gonna go like a nosedive really it's got fast. To. Um, so I think the best case scenario, I want to see the Big 12 dissolve. I want to see us obviously go to the SEC. I want to see two teams go to the ACC. Two teams go to the Big 10, and a couple schools go to the Pac 12. And then there might be someone that's left out. I don't know what Probably two, Taylor. four, six, eight. And there might be a couple schools actually left out. I don't know. Might go down in the American athletic. You just. I would guess Baylor doesn't get bid by a power, or I guess it'd be a big four conference at that point. Baylor's just because... won a national championship in basketball. So, yeah. I mean, they're bringing that to the table at least. They've, there's true. just so many issues with that school as of late that. I don't know. Maybe that the maybe the basketball national championship will help them get somewhere. But and I'm pretty sure yeah. they're usually a pretty decent baseball hire, but no one cares about baseball, I guess. Yeah. Only- and just one one more deal. I know the pod proposal is OU, Texas, and Missouri and Arkansas. That's been proposed, which I'd much rather see Texas A&M instead of Missouri in there because the, that would be fun. The but- problem with pods is, I mean, if, if first of all, if that is the pod. If we have Arkansas, Texas, and Missouri, that's a fun pod for us. Like that that should be favorable the problem with it is in that suggested we're like in that thing where that suggested that pod for oklahoma the the pod that alabama was in was like alabama georgia lsu and tough yeah something ridiculous so like if the alabama georgia and florida are gonna throw the they're gonna throw a fit in auburn yeah and also like that's ridiculous so they're They're gonna gonna throw a fit (laughs) there's no way that happens i think that's gonna be the biggest Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, like they're gonna be like, so Oklahoma gets to go beat up on Arkansas and Missouri, and we get to play Georgia, Florida, and Auburn every year. Like, no, that, that it's never yeah. gonna work that way. They're gonna have to break it up somehow. I think that's gonna be so. Two things. I think that if it is pods, that won't happen because Alabama won't let that happen. They're the big dogs of the SEC. What they say goes, and that'll be an adjustment for us as Oklahoma fans because we run the Big Twelve. If we don't, you know other than the TV time that are like being scheduled in the morning, you know, what Oklahoma says for the big 12 kind of went. So we just have to put our dominance, you know, make a footprint in the sec so that we can be equal to Alabama at some point. Um, and then if it is pods, do you guys think that they would do like a mini tournament to decide who is in the sec championship at that point? They would have to it, like the pods to me would be the hardest format of all. Yeah. It'd be like a, it'd be like the NFL, right? So like if you're, you know, whoever's four and in your division or in your pod, you then would go to a four team tournament and then just elimination to be the SEC champion. It, it would be, yeah, it, it, it well, would be way too tricky to figure out. I don't out know. I, I feel like they put in the pods only just to do the scheduling deal. And then you would just go East and West division overall. It would be like you have the AFC, NFC, and then you've got all the East, west you know all those other divisions within the conference 
I think that's how it would be. The pods would be on one, two pods on one side, two pods on the other. And then the winner, you know, it would just be the best overall in conference record. I don't know. It, it's going to be tough, but uh, we're, we're probably going to wrap it up here pretty quick. But the one thing, um, you know, there's going to be much more to talk about on the OU Texas SEC, um, you know, local news, thunder draft tonight, uh, three first round picks, you know, they got the number six pick. Um, We'll see what happens. I know they they wanted the number one pick to get Cade Cunningham, but it sounds like they're not going to. Some, some draft day, uh, some, some draft night trades going to be possible tonight. Yeah, you never know. We'll see. We'll see how it plays out. As long sure. as they don't get rid of uh, Shea, it doesn't matter. Just That's make true. sure you keep that guy around. That whenever those rumors about him on the being on the move came out, I thought that the Thunder might as well just go ahead and resell because you can't keep just stocking up draft picks getting good players it's like freaking baseball being like the pirates of baseball just come in be here for five years and then we'll ship you off to the highest bidder yeah yeah so no i think that trade rumor of the number six pick sga for the number one is insane but anyway (laughs) so uh you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap this up here pretty quick we're not here to take part we're here to take over conor mcgregor once said that but oh you're gonna say that to the sec (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so all righty well we really appreciate it if you guys have made it this far we really appreciate the support and you, you deserve a medal for listening to us ramble on for nearly 40 minutes uh and if I you hadn't already one. make sure yeah make sure to hit the subscribe button like uh comment let us know what you think about uh the topics we covered today especially the hot topic of ou in texas and the sec so uh we really appreciate the support keep spreading the word and we will keep put, putting out great content for you guys thanks <laughs>